You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ and Randy. Credit card chips have caused a lot of headaches, and it turns out they have a big flaw. Italy votes against a constitutional referendum and Amazon's automated future. All this and more on episode 185 here on Wednesday, September, I'm sorry, December 7th, 2016. Randy? In the traditional markets, JJ, we've got gold steady at $1,174. Silver rises to $17.09 an ounce. Oil is up to $49.84 a barrel. The Dow Jones rises to a new record high again this week to 19,549 points. The 30-year U.S. Treasury yield continues to climb to 3.026%. The euro is up slightly to $1.08. The Chinese yuan is fluttering around 14.5 cents as China's foreign reserve drops to $3.1 trillion. The British pound is $1.26. And in what do we have in crypto? In the crypto markets, we have Bitcoin is up at seven sixty seven, and the rest, I'm, everything else is down from Litecoin to three sixty three, dollars Zcash at fifty three seventy one, Dash at $8.76, Ethereum at $8.40, Monero at $7.69, Rep is down to $3.17, Doge equals one Doge. Now, just a reminder that you can tune in to Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. If you don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews, you, sus- you can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, Library, and more. All the places. Thanks, Randy. Well, if you're out using the new credit card chips, I, I wonder how many of your vendors are actually using the chip part because in, in quite a few experiences I've had locally, the vendors are not using chips at some of the big box stores. Now, in some locations, they are. But they, they uh, often speak of headaches, delays, um, and problems that arise from the chip uh, uh, without that. Now, the chip was meant to create a security uh, apparatus to help fight some of this identity theft that's run so rampant. In fact, about $15 billion annually is lost to identity theft and the credit card companies are looking to mitigate that because a lot of that money ultimately comes out of their pockets and their their profits. Well, CNN broke a uh, CNN money broke a story that the chip added to credit cards is sp- supposed to make them more secure is not so secure after all. These chips are called EMV, which stands for Euro Pay, Mastercard, and Visa, and at its core, it consists of a proprietary system that not much is known about. When you use the magnetic strip of a card that has a chip, the machine is supposed to prompt you to use the chip reader instead. Security researchers at tech company NCR found that the magnetic strip can be rewritten to show that the card has no chip. At this point, the chip is bypassed and the card is able to be counterfeited, just like they've been doing for for so long. The whole point of this chip was to stop the whole card counterfeiting, right? But now the cards can simply be rewritten as if they didn't have a chip. That's not the only flaw. No, that flaw was found because the most payment devices and card readers are transmitting your transactions in plain text. Okay? Plain text. You got to watch out for that encryption. The government doesn't want you to have that encryption. Well, the encryption would have protected people from that. Mm. It would have made that chip actually useful. Now, (laughs) the thing is, most of these card readers and devices come with encryption. They're just not enabled by default, which is silly when you think about it. But it turns out a lot of vendors are looking to not even handle that because I'm sure there might be some time uh, dealing with the programming and interfacing with your specific point of sale unit. But uh, so a lot of the vendors are just simply selling the machines and not the security upgrade. Now, it's available, but a lot of these storefronts, they've already paid up to $500 for the new machine in addition to whatever software costs come with it and whatever upgrades they have to get for their new uh, point of sale to work with the machine. So they're paying, uh, I don't even know how much, but the estimation is that the upgrade for card reading uh, technology at storefronts across the United States is going to be about $25 billion. Wow. Now, some of the uh, the, the uh, estimates as to or, or surveys that have been done by the Nielsen Group Uh, have found that only 2 million out of the 8 million merchants in the United States have upgraded their machine. And part of the thing about upgrading the machine that really incentivizes the 
the merchant to do it, is that Visa and MasterCard are saying, if you don't have the machine upgraded by, by a certain deadline date, then any, any fraudulent activity that occurs at your location, you have to cover. So that comes out of your pockets, right? Wow. So it's strong arming an upgrade, Very, basically. Exactly. For security, right? A secure... Oh, Oh crap! That's what. The, but now, oh, no. but now the entire chip upgrade has already been defeated. When not even when the deadline for the uh, the storefronts, I believe, was 2016. Uh, I'm sorry, 2015. Last year was the deadline for storefronts, which I think has been kept steadily moving back because of lawsuits that the credit card companies are facing over this uh, impending deadline. Now the gas pumps had a deadline of 2017. That's since been moved back to 2020, and they've been citing the unique challenges facing the outdoor gas pump machines, and of course, the uh, you know the gas pumps aren't actually used fraudulently as often. In fact, the gas pump has only uh, skimmed about 1.3 percent of the fraudulent activity. So huh. that's crazy. I mean, I saw this in in Europe, you know, before I saw it here in the United States and what you were saying, seeing it here in the United States, I keep seeing like post-it notes and stuff stuck in the like chip slot to say like, no, don't use this please. And, um, you know, that, that's what I've mainly seen in the U S but when I was uh, traveling in Europe, there was these terminals at every restaurant that people brought out and they'd put your chip card in and, you know, it never left the table. It was kind of nice in that regard. It actually did feel a little more secure if only for that reason, for the in-person, um, but yeah, I just remember asking them about it because I'd never seen it before. And they said, oh yeah, it's they've rolled it out here. It's more secure, blah, blah, blah. But you'd think these problems would have arisen uh, before. Interesting. Well, and yeah, part of the, the merchants are, are complaining with these lawsuits that the credit card companies are basically taking the cost of, of identity theft security and then making the merchants bear it. Now, I'm sure the merchants should have some sort of um, expense with protecting their customers, right? In their own store and making sure their customers are, are proceeding in their transactions safely and whatnot. But if if the uh, the equipment they're using isn't even encrypted, then anybody with a skimmer is going to be able to, to find it. And, and what they're finding or what they're suggesting or, or is possible or what is actually happening is that either storefront cashiers, store owners themselves, or a friend of the cashier is placing a skimmer device inside of the, the point of sale computer, and then they're actually collecting all this data. And as soon as the chip works, that starts a one minute clock. Now, once the chip uh, is 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 activated and a transaction happens with it, the the skimmer then can take that information onto another machine and start making transactions with that same uh, information, and that they will also be accepted within that one minute window because it expires. So every time a chip is used, it gives a one minute um, usage for a code. And huh. that and that that's that was that's what allows the transaction to happen. And the code is valid for one minute, but the skimmer gets it, sends it to the device, and now they've got a whole minute to go shopping. You know, and the device usually they'll have waiting to buy something, just waiting for the confirmation and bam. So the the expense of um, of dealing with these chips and the headaches that is, is happening, it, it certainly isn't worth it at this point. I wonder if anyone lost their job. Oh, I doubt it. <laughs> but uh, moving on, we've got a store about automation, and there's so much to talk about when it comes to automation, but let's start with your everyday groceries. Yeah, so the very first Amazon Go, yep, Amazon is opening a grocery store, uh, and there will be no cashiers, no registers, and no lines. There's been a viral video going around showing... Uh, what this will be looking like, but the first one's actually going to be opening in Seattle as early as early as as early as next year, early next year. Um, and Amazon internal plans reveal that the online retail giant uh, plans to open as many as two thousand of these stores across the United States. Wow, um, so that's a lot. It is. There's uh, the big brick and mortar grocery chain Kroger, which also owns Ralph's and uh, uh, several other stores, has around twenty six hundred locations. Um, Amazon Go shoppers would use an app on their phone to keep track of items in their cart, uh, and it can keep track of when you actually put things back. And I don't, it, I, I don't know if you're going to be scanning these things or if it just knows by proximity, um, but I'm guessing more proximity based. Uh, and then you just walk out the door when you're finished shopping, and your Amazon account is automatically billed. Uh, which, well, you know what? This, this really, in a way, this is technology is amazing, and yeah. I'm really happy that Amazon is doing this. 
But in another way, I'm like, I'm just thinking, wow, now Amazon is is going to be routing the, the grocery markets like they've routed the online sales and, and um, distribution markets, right? Mm-hmm. But imagine them combining, an, uh, an, you know, this, this grocery store probably takes up a lot of space and has a big warehouse attached to it. Mm-hmm. You know what else could they use that warehouse for? But fulfillment and like their their existing distribution network, like yeah. it's just amazing what what this can do. But but there's more to the story, of course. Well, I, to me, I'm thinking more long term, especially if they've already got these plans for two thousand of these stores across the U.S. I'm curious to see how competitors are going to react. I mean, you've got to you've got to think this is going to affect prices and certainly employment. But on the price side. Um, you know, if you've got lower labor costs, how are how are smaller businesses going to begin to compete? I mean, they're already dealing with a very, very big business that has plenty of money to throw at this kind of new adventure, especially early on to incentivize new customers. As if they did, even if they didn't need to, just the fact that you can come in and never have a line, like that's enough. That, to, I that think for- a lot of people will go for that, especially here in Manchester. We shop at a local store, and it's a very popular store. And the shopping experience is great until you get in line. And then yeah. there's always, always, there's always not enough registers open. And then there's, uh, you know, each customer has little nuances to their order that need to be completed. That, uh, you know, it's just, I think a lot of people are going to, are going to go for this Amazon. Plus, uh, let's face it, people are, are moving towards less and less actual interaction with another person if they can, if they can ask or if they can have it, you know, mm-hmm. it just sort of simplifies the routine. Yeah, and one can only imagine that it wouldn't cost that much more for delivery. And hey, would you like to get your packages delivered with that? You know, so I, I'm sure that's not too far along. Um, so I, I think besides competing with the convenience and lower price, um, smaller businesses are, are you know going to begin to suffer, and they're going to have to cut back on labor. And that's where I see it really being, you know, very curious. There's uh, according to the latest numbers available from May 2015, there were 856 thousand. 850 cashiers working at grocery stores uh, around the U.S. And, you know, it's, that's going to be, or obviously this, is, this isn't going to happen overnight, but that's going to create, it's going to destroy almost a, an entire category of jobs. Um, and, well, and, 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 sure, sure. But I, mean, I think of course, new ones come around. Need, you're but, still going to need people there. I, I don't think you can have a fully automated store because uh, sure. there's, there's going to at least be questions and answers that need to be... Um, and, and then the stockers themselves. I mean, robots can probably stock most of the shelves. I'm imagining, but um, yeah, I I, th- I still think there is some some people jobs. But then there's also like the skilled trades that come with making sure all of this automation happens and maintaining it and the sure. infrastructure. And so now you have jobs that transfer. You don't you don't you do lose some jobs, but they become more skilled. Um, you know, more long-term viable jobs. Yeah. It's just, it's going to be a lot of, we're going to see a lot of entry level positions going away, which is, um, you know, tough, not only from a standpoint of lots of people who have held these jobs for a long time, banking on uh, retirement or pension, but also for entry level for people who are entering the workforce for the first time, who want to gain that kind of experience. Uh, it becomes a much bigger barrier to entry. Um, I mean, I'm not saying these, this is good or bad or anything. I'm just you know, saying what sure. I'm seeing, um, there's going to be a shift. Obviously, the, everything shifts. Everything changes all the time. But uh, <clears throat> for people who've wor- worked in this industry for a long time, they may be seeing themselves out of a job. And, of course, Amazon has been making headlines in the past year for testing drone delivery technology. Um, and that brings up freight and transportation. Um, there's 826,000 package delivery driver jobs. And when autonomous technology starts to replace them, and then you start talking about professional truck drivers, the guys and the men and women who get uh, the stuff from factories to the the grocery stores and everything like that. Three point five million professional truck drivers, and that is the most incentivized, really, <clears throat> to go more autonomous. Um, that the, they're estimating that there's one hundred sixty eight billion dollars annually that can be saved just by eliminating labor costs, increased fuel efficiency, um, less downtime, fewer accidents, being able to travel. Um, at off-peak hours, there's all kinds of things that can be incentivized where, you know, ports that are currently congested at certain times, you know, all these, just so many factors can go into create, making this so much more efficient, but it's going to create a big hole. And now uh, I'll, I'll close up on this because it's just a tangent I went on t- today thinking about automation. 
and again, not saying good or bad. I, I think technology is fantastic, and you know, I, I'm I'm for efficiency personally. But w- what we saw with taxi drivers uh, blocking streets and you know ramming Uber drivers and stuff. I mean, are we going to see vandalism against autonomous trucks by? We're going to have people who own big big rigs I, and don't sure. have a job. And I think there will be isolated incidents of that. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. I'm not trying to create fear oh, no. mongering or no. anything or, or scaring anybody. I'm just thinking out loud of, of what could very well happen. Definitely. Well, it, you know, there's there's so much that can happen, both good and and potentially some bad things. Of course, the unseen. Who knows what unseen this this equals? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to scare anybody. Oh no. I'm just, thinking it's it's, it's <laughs> i know you're it's not big, scared deep, jj but deep thoughts with i don't want to scare our neocash list neocash radio listeners who check into our blog regularly at neocashradio.com and listen in every wednesday night thank you guys that's right or they can tune into to youtube and watch our stuff that's right all right what's going on in italy JJ? italy is <laughs> the next big now there's been a lot of of elections that have caused a big stir very recently of course donald trump was the first one but time man of the year, by the way. Ugh. Donald Trump was Time's man of the year? That's, yeah. Oh, my God. Yep. Uh, anyway, sorry. Go a- ahead. Anyway, Gambia recently, they they elected a a businessman and a real estate uh, businessman, and they've gotten rid of their tyrant. So the big, big moves, and there's talk about prosecuting him for some of the things he's done. Now, of course, we'll have to see what happens when this person gets in office, but this would be the first time in 22 years that a peaceful... A uh, handoff of power has occurred in Gambia, and this bodes really well for that very poor country. So we'll, we'll definitely keep an eye on what's going there, and uh, if it actually happens. But the uh, the winner, uh, Adama Barrow, um, or Raz Adama Barrow, I believe I'm that's his name. I'm not going to try. Sorry, man. Okay. So anyway, uh, we're going back to Ital- Italy. So there was a referendum before Italy, and the PM... Mata Rinzo, uh, Matteo Matteo Renzi. Renzi. Yes, thank you. Uh, he staked his seat on it. He staked his job on this referendum, and he said, "If it wins, then I'll stay on, and and I will continue to be in charge of the ruling party. And if it loses, then I resign." Well, he is resigning because that referendum failed. The referendum would have altered much of Italian's Italy's sixty-eight-year-old constitution. The constitution was created after the fall of Mussolini and it sought to divvy up the power among as many as it could and make it a very deliberate process to change laws. After the fascist Mussolini regime, of course, they were doing, they were, you know, they had a really good mindset for, for making a, a constitution, you know, back then. Mm-hmm. Anyway, the referendum put forth to voters would have done much to consolidate power in the hands of a few. For example, the Senate would have been neutered and relegated to a consulting role with fewer members, thus giving most legislative power to the lower house. Military power would have been consolidated into a national system rather than the provincial system that is now in place. The current system is far from perfect, with the Senate and the Italian government overall known for its delay, waste, and corruption, like any government. I mean, the United States, much yep, the same. Yep. Uh, we mentioned the scandals surrounding Italian banks in a previous episode. Uh, Italian, Italy's per capita income uh, is second worst in Europe after Greece, and the national debt is a hundred thirty percent GDP, and that GDP is vanishing. In fact, ab- about as much as twenty percent is leaving the country due to all of these financial issues, and the growth, the unemployment rate. I could go on and on. Italy and Greece have a lot in common. The difference is Greece is really kowtowed to the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the eurozone lenders, and pretty much anyone that can help it in its fate, whereas Italy is is a little bit different. In fact, the 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 winner or the no vote, I should say, the no vote was led by the Five Star Movement. It's an anti-establishment group led by comedian Pepe Grillo. The group was pushing a referendum of their own that calls for a return to the Italian national currency, the lira, and a rejection of the euro. So this is really big news coming out of Italy because after the Brexit. You know, the Brexit hasn't actually happened yet. Yes, the vote happened and the big, you know, you know the big scandal and, and, and uh, hoopla about it, but it, it's still not taking place. And there are serious legal challenges that's going to have to happen before the Brexit can move forward. In fact, the recent news I saw was that it actually has to be uh, taken to Parliament, that Theresa May can't simply, 
unilaterally uh, follow through with the referendum. But in Italy, with this no vote, the uh, the PMs resigned, the prime ministers resigned, and there is going to be a new government formed. And there's a lot of strength with the Five Star Movement. They had a, a, a very strong mayoral campaign, and, and mayors in Italy have a lot of power in their, their little uh, districts and provincial and, and, and divisions and whatnot. And they won a lot of mayor seats. Tw- t- uh, of the runoff mayor seats, there was 20 of them. They won 19. So the, the five-star movement is growing. That doesn't mean they're going to win the referendum. It doesn't mean that they're going to win anything sig- significant. What it does mean is that it, in Italy, they're definitely not going along with the Euro program anymore. They're definitely not looking at being part of Europe. They're looking at being it- Italy, Then that's it. So mm-hmm. big news out of Italy. And th- I think this will have a lot of ramifications with not just uh, Brexit, but also Grexit with Greece and the other countries that are right on the edge, like Spain. Yeah. So let's move on to a internet company. Yeah. So go- there's a little company called Google. Have you heard of them before? Tiny, very tiny. Yeah. Uh, they are going to be powered 100% by renewable energy starting next year. Is it so, like Soylent? No. <laughs> okay. uh, they've actually focused mainly on wind and solar farms uh, thus far because I guess in 2012 they said they were going to do this within five years. And uh, they got up to 44% last year. And you know now they were just looking to keep good on their promise, I guess. And so they bought contracts so they're not, to be clear, they're not producing all of this energy or buying it directly. They are offsetting with credits, buying from renewable energy sources. Um, but they've they've scooped up contracts for wind and solar. They are looking for uh, longer tenure contracts that also may include uh, hydroelectric power or biomass, or uh, they're not ruling out nuclear energy. If there's things that can be found that are clean, they're saying nothing really now satisfies it, but they're not ruling it out if it's found to be uh, satisfactory. But anyway... Uh, their data centers, their massive data centers in the offices for their 60,000 plus employees will be fully powered by renewable energy and renewable ge- renewable energy credits uh, beginning next year. Uh, for reference, last year they bought five bought or produced 5.7 terawatt hours of renewable energy. Uh, and just for scale, the total amount generated by all solar panels in the UK over the same year was 7.6 terawatt hours. So it's quite a bit. Um, they've Google has come under fire, as other companies have that have big, huge, massive data centers um, for their carbon footprint. And basically, they have they don't reveal exact figures on how much usage, energy usage their data centers do. But as a company, Google's actually responsible for one one hundredth of a percent of global electricity usage. Which wow, is, which is that is huge. Yeah, uh, they and they do acknowledge that much of that comes from the data centers. Um, they've actually been working with some AI technology when they bought uh, DeepMind back in 2014, which is a, an AI company, a machine learning company. They deployed uh, some machine learning uh, software in their data centers to take a look at how to reduce electricity costs. Um, basically, seeing knowing when peak hours are going to be, knowing how to. Um, begin cooling earlier and uh, just all sorts of things that a human could never get anywhere near as as precise and they've actually been able to reduce the energy usage by 15 percent with machine learning in some of their uh, data centers where they were testing this and so now they're actually deploying it in all of their data centers so uh, that's something that's neat and it's we talked a little bit uh, a week or two ago about how we're reaching peak gasoline demand and um, you know uh, so it's just another sign that more people are looking at renewable. And, and they were pretty open about the fact that they weren't looking at this from a greenwashing, quote unquote, point of view, but that this was the most cost effective, that this was something they were able to, to lock in. Um, but that's but that it took five years to lock in some of these contracts. They, they said it was tough to navigate and negotiate really complex long term power purchase agreements. Um, the, their EU energy lead explained, uh, it's complicated. It's not for everyone. Smaller companies will struggle with the documents. We are buying power in a lot of different jurisdictions, so you can't just copy and paste agreements, unquote. So, right. Yeah, you're, you're dealing with a lot of case-by-case basis. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's really good to see this sort of stuff and see uh, this sort of leadership from uh, Google, such a large company with a lot of influence. And, and a lot of people look to replicate what google does just like a lot of people look to replicate what apple does because they're a successful company and so this is good stuff um i think 
you know, solar has just huge promise. Of course, it gets me into the thinking, like, like just, just for a moment, imagine that solar panels are just amazing, just outstanding, amazing things, and they're really cheap and easy to produce, and everybody has them. And then, of course, like a mild ice age happens and snow everywhere. Yeah. And cloud skies. Like, oh, darn. Yeah. Diversify. Can we burn them? I don't know. Can we burn the solar panels for warmth? Backups. You got to diversify. But anyway, um, the, the Google stuff is is exciting. And I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm kind of a person who I don't like how much power Google has. Yeah. I'm with you. I, I really have an issue with that. And just from a fundamental standpoint, it doesn't even matter. I don't care. You know, they, they had this thing of do no evil. This was like a company motto. It's not their motto right. anymore. Yeah. They got rid of that. Wow. Are you aware of that? I, I am. It's okay. still it's still a good reminder every day as yes. as we get ready to post to YouTube and as we're looking at our notes in Google Drive yes. and as we I got totally... my Google phone. Yes. In, you know, I'm using Chrome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you though. It's I, I'm I'm happy they're doing something okay, good. I, it's though, just too. something we, we should we should talk about this from time to time, <laughs> and not ignore the elephant in the room. No, yeah, and we do. We talk about Yahoo being scumbag and selling customer data to to law enforcement and things like that. But yeah, Google's Google's on the watch us list too. I'm definitely yep. am I, keeping an eye. I am very much sure of that. Um, do you have anything else, Randy? Uh, we got a couple things, just a quick mention, uh, because we like to talk about security uh, with cryptocurrencies. Thinking beyond you know, controlling the private keys, which we always want you to do, there was actually a case this last week, a gentleman named Bo Shen, who is known by some as uh, what would be called a whale, someone who's got quite a bit of cur- cryptocurrency. In this case, he was an early holder of a lot of Augur Rep tokens and Ethereum. He allegedly got hacked via social engineering. Um, apparently his, his phone company, he was, someone was able to call his cell phone company and get some kind of recovery password, uh, for an email or something like that. And once they were in the email, they of course got control of everything else, moved all of his funds and, uh, dumped them. And so there was a big, big market response on the, uh, did they, they rep call market. his company or did they get a hold of his phone? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't. No, off the top of my head, there were some details that were given out via Twitter, but they were kind of third party and his Twitter account hasn't uh, verified. But it was, it, yeah, it looks like it was just a case of social engineering where someone, you know, made a phone call or sent, you know, got a hold of a rep online or something like that and was able to uh, get a hold of, you know. Yeah, it has to deal with his, his uh, using your phone, uh, recovery phone number and basically that sort of exploit. Or some sort of right connection to that. So using like your phone number as a recovery, yeah, that really doesn't make sense at all. Um, I don't know why. Okay, so here's the thing: if they took control of his phone, okay, so and then they had a recovery system where it gets it gets sent to your phone, and your your phone is like a two FA sort of authentication, and then you can go and, and recover your account. Then, wow. It really sucks that he got his phone hacked or taken. So this, it's difficult because we have tweets that were, this is all coming off of. Yeah. It's, so, I mean, there's been a little bit written off, about it as well, but it's ma- mainly going off of those tweets. So, so I haven't it's found anything fresh like off the press. Definitive. Yeah. Well, uh, well, we'll definitely keep track and, and we'll probably have a little uh, security thing about this to talk about within the next week or so. But what, you had something else? Yeah. And then there's one more. Basically, um, we, we talk a lot about financial technology and fintech is kind of what's been uh, the, the term for it. So fintech startups have companies that are using technology to take care of financial problems. So things that are like cryptocurrencies and all sorts of other items that use blockchains. We talk about them a lot. Uh, they, they're running into all kinds of regulatory hurdles, uh, basically because in each, in each state, in each city, in each country, however you want to say it, there's varying levels of awareness. Most, Government officials don't know very much about these things, and these are uh, ahead of the curve, and government famously runs behind the curve. So um, they've been running up against frustrations in trying to raise money and in trying to perform some of the same functions that banks provide, um, but they're running up against hurdles because they're being classified as banks. So the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency has created this the so-called Office of Innovation, and they want to start appointing or allowing 
whatever, appointing national charters to these fintech firms. So wherever they're starting up, they can apply for a national charter that basically allows them to perform certain banking functions that were previously reserved for just banks and credit unions and things like that. These firms can participate in some of those nationally without needing to apply for licenses within each state or something like that. So it may... Does it streamline the bureaucracy? It may. It may provide some kind of sandbox and some some banks are not pleased about it. But I also see that the so-called chief innovation officer, uh, Beth Knickerbocker, uh, doesn't exactly scream innovation to me. I took a look at her LinkedIn profile and I see that she's worked previously as the uh, vice president of the senior regulatory council for the American Bankers Association. Uh, and earlier this year, touting so-called responsible innovation in the in the fintech sector. Uh, she also said she that wanted to, quote, we want the federal banking system to remain vibrant and capable. So it doesn't look like she wants to uh, make any room for financial technology that operates outside of the banking system's clause. So I, I hope it streamlines, streamlines it, but I'm a little leery of Beth Knickerbocker. Well, thanks for that, Randy. And uh, if you want to find out more about Neocash Radio, you can tune in to our show every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment in your awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, I'll Be RY, and more. Thanks again. This is JJ and Randy for Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today.